Welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, today, we're really thrilled to get an update on the latest release of OpenShift Commons, um, OpenShift Commons, uh, OpenShift Container Platform. Uh, 3.7 is out the door, and Steve Spiker, who's part of the um, product management team, is going to give us a, up, uh, a, a basically a quick and dirty, very fast um, overview of everything in 3.7. You can ask questions in the chat. We'll have live Q&A at the end. Um, and we're going to try and do this in right, right around 30 minutes, which is a lot because there's tons of new features in 3.7. So I'm going to let Steve um, get started and um, take it over there, Steve. Thanks, Diane. So this is Steve Spiker. I work on the part of the OpenShift product management team. Um, and uh, really excited to talk to you today about all the new stuff coming in. And, OpenShift Container Platform 3.7. Um, and so as, as Diane mentioned, this is an abbreviated uh, set of uh, presentation material. You know, the, some of it's been pushed to the back. There's something like 120, I didn't count the final one, that covers everything in sort of detail. But I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights. And so we'll, we'll go that, through that in the next 30 minutes. Feel free to put some questions uh, in the chat. I know Diane and uh, Tushar in the background, kind of keeping an eye on that, um, but we'll just go forward. So a quick uh, you know, intro slide as far as OpenShift and the base of what it is. And we look at what Red Hat provides with OpenShift. It's it's a it's kind of a complete layer for your for your application. You know, from the the standardization down to a secure um, uh, operating system as far as the enterprise Linux goes for 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 abstracting away the the physical, virtual, or public, private, whatever infrastructure you're dependent on. And then um, beyond that, how do you manage a larger number of those computers, right? So they, they need to, for cluster management um, or orchestration of your applications and deployment across all those different uh, compute nodes and a lot of different requirements there. And so that's that's the main Kubernetes part. And then on the type of things that help you leverage that platform with a number of uh, capabilities around the uh, management of those applications, the, the deployment automation, build automation, number of services and the ability to self-service. So we'll we'll dig into some of those. Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about the, the timeline and the roadmap. So typically we put out a release about every three to four months. And so our 3.6 release, we, we've uh, just delivered in August, it seems like yesterday. And here we are getting ready to put out 3.7. And as you know, you can take the, the Kubernetes distribution number and add 2.0 to it and you get the OpenShift numbers. Um, uh, we're continuing to move forward with this rate and pace and, and continue to uh, uh, pick up the, the latest and greatest Kubernetes distribution and uh, adding in the capabilities doing our validation and then distributing to our end users. So within the container platform, it's our it's our distribution of the software of, of OpenShift, of that, uh, the, the namely the OpenShift origin uh, repository, uh, uh, open source project. And so what you look th through there, and then as we build on top of those, was the main capabilities we delivered on it and around it, it's really around uh, enabling some capabilities around multi-cloud services. So there's always this key, and I'll dig in more about what we've done there, uh, around bringing uh, different off-platform services onto the platform and better ways to integrate with different uh, infrastructure and automation for delivering of that. So digging in, uh, what is uh, what is sort of the main pain point you've struggled with in IT? A lot of times it's like, well, how long is it gonna take me to spin up a VM to do some testing on or to do some development on, or what's it gonna take for me to, to be able to request access or some amount of da uh, data on either a test database or even a, a, a production one, you know, going through the process. It's typically, you gotta open some type of Ticket, whether it's service now or, or or whatnot, you have to you know clearly identify your business needs, your the re request itself. Um, you wait weeks, months, hopefully not. You you get the approval. Eventually, come back. You uh, have something that is the credentials you need to, to connect to that thing, and then hopefully it can work, and hopefully you understand how to in inject it into your application. Well, the whole point of this is to automate that away, right? So the request, the consumer says, "Hey, I want to." piece of this uh, service uh, fills out the needed form, the service provider will receive that request and then either immediately or asynchronously return back the uh, um, the, the needed pieces to uh, to connect to it and then inject it on that place. So 
good stuff. Um, part of the that model is is built off of a open API. So there's a a, a multi vendor standardization effort that has taken the proven uh, service broker API that has been a part of uh, the um, the Cloud Foundry uh, service catalog feature and uh, put a lot of effort into kind of uh, baking in and, and really hardening some of the definitions around that API and then leveraging that for work within within Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, so what is a service broker? Service broker is really just automated standard thing entry point into the service. So it, it's the one who, you know, as the name would say, brokers the conversation between the service catalog or really the consumer through the service catalog. The catalog is just a manifestation of all the services that the service brokers provide. And then the service provider will facilitate that request. And so one of the big things we've done in the 3.7 release is we've completely um, redone the user experience. So when you're looking at um, a initial login, you will see a, uh, a page not just telling you about, hey, you need to create a project or, hey, here's the project you need to work with. It'll say, here's the service or here's the things you can do on the platform and also some additional material to help you get started. So there's the ability to take a tour. Um, so I'll just take a minute from off the presentation here and I'll drop over to actually a running instance. So uh, here we have a starter cluster that's running 3.7. As you can see, it's a, the new experience. If I wanted to, I could take the guided tour to help me understand what I uh, can do and how I can leverage the interface. Uh, I can jump right into some of the languages. I say, like, well, I kind of like JavaScript. I'll just grab this and quickly uh, be able to provision a uh, Node.js application to be able to run this. So uh, I'll give it a new name. So I'll give it one, uh, two, hit repo. And look just like that. I've deployed my, my Node.js application. If I wanted to, I could kind of quickly go over here and see what's going on. Um, also, if I wanted to play around kind of locally, I could just uh, go to OpenShift Origin. I could look at the releases. Um, this is the upstream I could see. There's a 3.7.0 RC0. I'll, what I've done is I downloaded the OC command, and I can do an OC uh, OC cluster, type it up, and then I can point to the version I went to. I can say deploy the service catalog, and um, it's that simple. It's up and running. I've done that already, so I've preloaded it, and here, you know, here's an instance of of that running. It looks just like what I just showed there, hosted by Red Hat as part of our online starter tier, but here it is running uh, locally in my environment, and so I can go to my project. I can see you know, I have different um, applications already running. If things don't look healthy, whatever reason, I can kick off a build. And I can also see um, the great integrated experience we have here, including uh, that came in 3.6. We all come together here and seeing the, the things working um, to build logs in line and, and seeing everything I need to see at a glance. So that was a quick view at that picture and a bit more of a real time or live uh, version of it. Um, so what makes all that happen? So I mentioned the service broker API and a service catalog implementation that exists. And we're gonna be rolling out um, uh, the template broker. So now you can take your OpenShift templates like you've been uh, deploying today and continue to deploy those applications. We're rolling out a new Ansible service broker which you can define a, uh, a, a an artifact called the Ansible Playbook Bundle, and it'll deploy that. Uh, we demonstrated uh, back, way back in uh, Red Hat Summit uh, some Amazon integration. We'll, we're doing work to bring that forward as well. And since it is an open uh, source broker API, it's an open API. You know, it's and people can write their own brokers. You can bring three part third party brokers, etc. So Ansible Service Broker. So this is relatively busy. Um, so there's a number of pieces, but it's actually a fairly simple concept. It's really, there's some broker that's pulling content from uh, a catalog itself. So some place that's got to hold that image. Uh, that, that image is just basically a bundled somewhere and it can provision a set of services. So that bundle itself just looks like um, 
a runtime to execute on it and a standard set of verbs that ma uh, files that match verbs. So if you match it up to the open service broker API, the different things you can do, provision, deprovision, bind, et cetera, and matches those things. Plus it adds some capabilities to do some additional validation such as testing. So a lot of good stuff there. I mentioned the template service broker. So that again, gives you the flexibility of leveraging the same interface to bring it onto the platform. It also adds in the capability to uh, inject config through binding. Um, and so binding is the, the action to not just provision, but once you provision, you want to inject your application with configuration of that service you're consuming. And the binding operation is, is part of that process. So we talked about the initial experience. Uh, one thing I didn't highlight, but there's a, a neat way to be able to search. You can either from the search bar itself, you can do it through the filtered views down below. There's, there's many easy ways to uh, manage getting at what you want. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's a lot of great content in there. So you need to, you need to search to find what you want. Um, <clears throat> so this is showing the binding operation. So if you have an existing um, set of instances, you can actually combine them together. Another great piece is notification. So you bring all of the notifications under the single uh, bell at the top. So we're all kind of used to seeing this now, whether it's from GitHub or other places is a common paradigm of a notification. Um, and so now a number of key notifications are here and you can do all kinds of things as you see there's you can mark them red, clear them, uh, et cetera. So you can, you can easily get the information you need and understanding what's going on within your environment. And if uh, hosting is not your game and you have the need to, to hack locally, uh, we, we have something for you. So I showed OC cluster up, which is the foundation for Minishift and the CDK. Uh, that provides a way to uh, run a, a single node uh, OpenShift cluster on your on your machine. It allows you to really validate out your um, application in a number of ways. And one of the some of the different p features that people have been asking for, it's really been helpful, is like around multiple uh, profiles or instances. So now I can easily say I have this this profile that kind of matches a certain set of applications, and I want to quickly switch to a different type. Uh, a profile, then you can do that now within the, uh, the CDK and mini shift. So let's move, I guess we're going to start at the top of the stack. We're going to move down the stack. So we're looking at like the, uh, the orchestration layer. Um, and one thing I'm just going to point to is that uh, there's already a uh, commons uh, webinar that talks about some of the work, work that's going on the Kubernetes 1.7. So I encourage you to uh, go um, watch that. And then also, um, there's a you know a number of exciting projects we just want to highlight was the custom resource definition so that's one of the uh, uh, some of the different ways that uh, extensibility has been integrated into the platform so now it's easier to, to add capability into a, a running uh, a Kubi, Kubernetes uh, instance itself uh, in, including encryptions and secrets within etcd uh, daemon sets and, and upgrades to to both uh, uh, stateful sets and burst mode as far as uh, scale up goes. So let's take through that a little bit more. Um, so a uh, lot of work around uh, uh, installation and upgrade improvements around what uh, we do with our Ansible playbooks that we ship product. Uh, so we have the capability to, to migrate etcd as it was before the 3.7 upgrade and, the, and they also be able to scale out the, the etcd cluster. So it's uh, quite important. And the other is the the ability to have a more modular installer. So you have a you may want to break things up into roles and different uh, playbooks so that you can target certain ad hoc administration tasks. So uh, a fair amount of work has gone in to provide those capabilities. In a new install experience around sort of breaking uh, breaking up um, the the installer itself into phases, and so uh, you'll see that as well. And now. Um, Jumping over to networking, um, if you've been following along, uh, especially within the OpenShift releases, we've had uh, net, uh, this core feature of a network policy and tech preview for a couple of releases and, and happy to announce it's coming out of tech preview. And so we've uh, done uh, brought, done the work to, to validate it and actually have supported. And so it's a great way to have really fine control access and, and rules around uh, or policies 
on uh, communication between the different um, services you have on the platform. So in the past, you would have the ability to either talk uh, all services within a given namespace, or you would have it uh, opened up across the, the cluster. Um, and then you could do certain things around joining namespaces if you had the multi-tenant uh, SDM plugin, which would pair those network, the, those namespace networks together, and then they could you know, have access to everything between those two. Now you have the ability to fine grain, say this specific service at this port can only receive incoming traffic from this this this, this uh, source itself. So, really a key a key feature. Uh, some other stuff around networking is uh, we allow the, the some flexibility around the cluster IP ranges. So it really allows for uh, things around uh, multiple set subnettings for host. I'm getting this request a lot, so glad to be able to provide this. Um, and this is also a, a popular topic is reference architectures. And so uh, we have a lot of, you know, one of the great things about uh, OpenShift is the ability to to run on, an, an as I mentioned, on, on bare metal, uh, on virtualized instances, on different uh, infrastructure layers and through different configurations. So uh, with that level of flexibility, it's, it's also very valuable to have uh, reference uh, architectures and implementation guides around that. So you'll see, uh, as we put out releases, we usually have a little bit of time after release when we roll out updates to these uh, reference architectures. So those will be rolling out um, as the release rolls out as well, or after the release rolls out. So well, that was a, I did not do a, dis, uh, a true um, coverage of everything that's part of the uh, orchestration layer. Um, but the pull point was I just wanted to hit on a couple of highlights and, and refer to you to the previous presentation to highlight some of the, the core capabilities. And then talking a little bit about what's going on within the container space. So one of the key things is a project called Cryo, uh, which you probably uh, heard in the, in the number of the commons uh, uh, meetings as well, the, the broadcast as, as part of what's going on there. Uh, we're doing work to um, validate that as, as part of, as it's a, it's a container runtime just focused on Kubernetes. And so we're doing validation. Uh, within OpenShift, and so we're coming out with a tech preview of that and uh, continue to test and validate that and strengthen that and, and look forward to moving that uh, out of tech preview uh, status. Um, one of the, a couple of the things that I just wanted to reiterate is since it's focused solely at the, on the Kubernetes use case, we're able to, Cryo is able to keep itself as a very minimal and secure architecture, so it doesn't have to concern itself with other use cases that may uh, expand the overall capability of it and they expand the number of interfaces and then possibly uh, you know, different uh, attack vectors. And with that as well, since we're focused on that, that given use case, we're able to really focus on scale and performance for that without having to be concerned about uh, a wide variety of, of uh, cases there as well. And it, the, the great thing about it is you don't have to change anything. So like the, someone asked recently, well, well, how will I notice the difference? And it's like, well, you won't, I mean, from an end user, it's just how containers run in the background. You still build your, your images the way you do today. Um, it'll just uh, run them and uh, you'll, you'll end user will, will, will not know any difference. Hopefully they'll, they'll notice a better performance. Um, along those lines is when you're looking at how you build those containers, you also uh, wanna have a, a a solution that will allow you to uh, have minimal dependencies as well. And so build as a, a daemonless tool for building and modifying OCI-based images. And so we look forward to, to rolling this out. And so this is just in a, in a tech preview fashion as well. So uh, builder is great stuff. Um, system containers have come out and support for, for uh, rel and atomic hosts. And this is a key part from the operating system update that can uh, that OpenShift uh, container platform is actually uh, is is using in a tech preview fashion. So uh, it allows you to bootstrap some of these capabilities. So if you, the container runtime is actually running within a system container itself, uh, so it's a it's a more flexible way to be able to manage and run the various pieces of the platform. Uh, and also allows for a set of capabilities as mentioned here. You know, it's real simple to to upgrade and roll back um, pieces within the managed by the system containers, and so that gives that level uh, isolation and flexibility as we've seen with containerized application. It's now 
uh, coming at a lower level within the operating system stack itself. Uh, so I, I overachieved and and sh shooting down my or cutting down my slides and and trying to get through the content. Um, but one of the, some of the things that I just wanted to reiterate is it's this is there's so much content I just didn't want to take too much time to like uh, cover everything in a bunch of detail. But I also wanted to make sure I covered some of the key highlights. And the the thing to to note is that it's it's a it's a release coming out. Um, you'll see announcements about it over the coming weeks. Uh, both the announcement of it, uh, the availability of it, uh, and way you get your hands on it. Uh, the the there's the ways you can get your hands on it today, as I mentioned, is is hopping into um, uh, the uh, open the GitHub.com OpenShift Origin repository, grabbing the 3.7 RC um, release and playing with it there. Uh, as a other aspect, as I mentioned, you can go to uh, openshift.com register for the uh, openshift online starter um, we are starting to roll out the 3.7 upgrades here we have it available in the, the canadian uh, regional cluster today and then um, yeah there's there's all these great ways you can you can always get your hands on the on the, the product bits uh, kind of early and, and, and see what it does and and also um, provide feedback through github issues issues the community forums, OpenShift Commons, uh, many, many good ways to provide feedback. So with that, um, I'll see if there's any questions. Steve, I think the main one really is, uh, you know, the rest I think we have addressed, but I think the main one is can they, can people get access to 3.7 RC code online, I think is the question. Um, so they can get access to 3.7 yeah, the, the the only code that you can get available today is through the uh, what's built through the OpenShift Origin repository, and then uh, the the actual release bits as far as like when uh, Red Hat will release the OpenShift Container Platform 3.7, uh, that's due out in a couple of weeks as far as when, when those bits will actually be available. I think the the other question that's actually um, has been answered in the um, in the chat, but I think it's worthy of saying out loud for people who are watching this as a video is people are asking, can you work now entirely without um, the Dr. Damon, um, and can you use Creo and build it? Uh, they were doing some tech preview there, so that is not, um, uh, yeah, so I see there from, from Benison, I answered some of these, where right, it's, there still needs a doctor for, for some of the building aspects, but if you're looking to, uh, isolate some of your workloads. I mean, there's always some a lot of interesting things you can do within OpenShift and containers to to label or isolate workloads so that you have builds only land on certain nodes, and so you can even further isolate um, different work workloads if you're even if you're experimenting with different things. But again, the Builder and Cryo are in tech preview in 3.7. So, okay. Um, let's see. There's a couple other questions. Once you pop over and take a look. Um, and see if we can do that. Um, Jonathan's asking, can you talk a little bit about how system containers work to isolate Kubernetes from the host OS? Are these Docker in Docker or VMs or something else? You, you want me to take that, Steve? Go for it, Ben. You're the, the you're... Yeah. So uh, system container, all it is is it's still a regular, you know, Docker container. We just add a, a little bit of metadata to the image, and then uh, we we run it slightly different. Uh, so if you've done the existing containerized installs for OpenShift, those will drop a unit file on the host. We we carry that forward with system container. Um, what's different though is uh, we store them on disk. Uh, we we leverage OS tree for the deduping. Um, so you know, if, again, the, the classic example of that is if you're troubleshooting a node and, and you know, you fill up the Docker pool and you blow that away um, with a system container uh, as that kube role or as the container runtime role, you won't blow away <laughs> those really important roles if you ever wipe the storage pool, right? So it gives us that kind of extra resiliency for um, bits you would, you would classically associate with being a part of the operating system, but you could still iterate and get all the advantages of running them containerized. Does that does that kind of help? I think so. I think that was a, a good answer to the question. Um, 
Let me just go back here and see. I think we we answered the question um, in chat too. Are you, are you imagining service brokers replacing templates? And and you did walk through the templates, um, being able to be used them as backends to service brokers. Uh, there was one other question. Yeah, I may just to be clear that the broker is just an API or a means to provide a service. At the end, there's still got to be something that defines what that application is or does some of the provisioning. And so templates are still, you know, a supportive way to do that. And Chris uh, had asked a question. I don't think we actually answered it. Can we access and set up accounts on the cluster where um, 3.7 um, is running? I think it was around the networking slides. And how does the networking policy compare to ITSEO, which is coming out? Uh, so, yeah, the, so the, the so, sorry, did I interrupt somebody? So, so yeah, it's a uh, network policy is really just focused at, uh, and I think uh, Tushari mentioned it there is, is the layer three, four aspects where uh, Istio is layer seven. Really, I mean, you look at network policy, it's a declarative model to define kind of the communication pass between the different services and what's allowed or, and not. And Initio itself is um, is a service mesh which has a lot of different capabilities around uh, policy as far as like, you know, what network policy kind of does. And then uh, also kind of a, program, uh, a programmatic uh, kind of routing aspect so you can do intelligent routing based on whatever criteria you define the program in. Uh, among other things like uh, uh, te telemetry, telemetry and, and different uh, reporting aspects to, to understand what the different um, you know usages are, you know what's what's actual traffic, what's being allowed, denied, etc. Um, so yeah, those are um, kind of uh, you know in some ways complementary, and, and also uh, Istio will provide a fair more uh, capability as well. There was one other question there. There's one other one. Yeah, um, do you have example service broker definitions or links to the documentation for how to create these? Maybe um, pop over to where the documentation is. Yeah, so the, um, it might be good to follow up with a link in, in the blog post itself, but I'll, I'll start digging into it. Uh, we've, we're working on our, increasing our enablement material. We've, we have, as someone called it, their, uh, uh, pre-alpha version of even an, a Go SDK to, to help uh, end users when writing brokers um, and working with the uh, appropriate um, uh, you know partnership teams to help enable uh, folks partners of writing service brokers itself. So, yeah. Like my. I don't have a good link for documentation, so I'll yeah. continue to search. Um, planned release date for 3.7. I think you mentioned. Yeah, the, the bits will be available by the end of the week, uh, not the end of the week, end of the month. So we're looking to, uh, through the official uh, Red Hat, um, you know, the OpenShift container platform will be available. To, to, um, I think the target date is November 29th, um, so we'll um, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, just in time for um, KubeCon, because um, we do everything based on when the next event is. But close to that. Um, Judd is asking, with RHEL now released on ARM, is Red Hat helping move Golang, helping Golang move to ARM? Hmm. Be off topic, but. I don't, know if you I don't know any status on that, so I'm not aware of anything. Um, if there's things um, about 3.7, um, we did this really fast today. That your people who are on this call want a um, yes, um, want a deeper dive into. Just um, email me on the mailing list or email me at dmuller at redhat.com, and I will try and stage this. Actually, I'll I'll chime in on ARM real quick. Uh, this has been on the on the rel side, and and eventually from the whole container platform, uh, I, I will say that we're we're definitely looking at at multi arch being 
uh, being on an option. So we will have base container enablement uh, coming up soon in RHEL for ARM. Uh, so probably around the 7.5 timeframe that, that all extras, repository, and base images will be there. Um, but then, you know, from there, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot more work to bring OpenShift to it. So, but, you know, that, that first phase is definitely uh, pretty solidified at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting me excited here. This is pretty cool. Um, and soon. So, yeah, so again, everybody, um, thank you for joining us. Oops, there's a mention of, uh, Federation is mentioned in the 3.9 category. Um, ooh, that's a good topic. Um, could you talk at a high level about the Federation roadmap? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the Federation roadmap um, I can talk about. So if, if uh, folks don't pay attention in the Kubernetes community, there's um, uh, the, the SIG Federation um, has been doing work around uh, understanding, you know, what is the right path forward for how Federation fits in the, the Kubernetes. So there's a couple different pieces of work around, uh, you know, what's the right use case, which is the right approach. And so they're doing some analysis around uh, those pieces, you know, whether it's a single uh, control plane that aggregates a number of backends and then replicates sort of state across those, or is it sort of another tool that sort of sits on the side that is controlling and working across those? Um, it's going through some type of that validation. Uh, you know, we're, we're um, when you look, when you break down the number of use cases around federation, uh, there's a lot of different pieces that play into it as far as global load balancing, uh, DNS, <clears throat> uh, geo-replication, uh, replication of, of images and state of uh, configuration. Uh, so we're doing a f uh, work um, kind of focused more on the, the registry end of that uh, scenario uh, towards the 3.9 release. And so um, <clears throat> that's, where, that's where it stands. Cool. So um, I'm going to do my final pitch here for questions. And um, so if you have one, pop it in the chat and we'll try and ask it. Um, the other thing that I want to just remind everybody is that the OpenShift Commons gathering, the face-to-face -face for all the upstream project leads and roadmaps, um, will be happening on December 5th in Austin, Texas, the day before KubeCon. So if you're coming to KubeCon, um, please consider registering and coming for that because you'll get um, folks from um, the engineering team, Clayton, Dan Walsh, and Rao, um, a number of the PMs will be there, as well as folks from um, the project leads for Kubernetes, um, and folks from Amazon talking about running OpenShift uh, and on there. So there'll be a lot of good folks in the room, as well as lots of customer case studies. So I'd love to see you all come there. And here's one last question for you. For the OpenShift-specific add-ons to Kubernetes, are there considerations of working towards a modularized plugin, e.g. a Helm model? Aha, there's a good one. So a modularized plugin, so I, if I understand this question correctly, it's is it maybe just a, you want to run Helm with OpenShift, or is it wants to follow a model like Helm um, as far as modularized plugins? I guess I can answer both of those. Um, so one is, um, you know, we published blog articles of what it takes to run to run Helm with OpenShift. And so there's some ways you can run it, uh, your Tiller server within a given namespace that will allow you to, you know, deploy Helm charts. Um, that's not something that's, you know, we don't ship and support Helm or Helm Tiller today, but that's a, you know, we, we define how you can do it. Um, as far as running a Tiller cluster-wide server, there's some considerations there you'd have to be uh, aware of if you're doing that. I mean, it sort of depends on your own deployment and, and, and what you're okay with there. Um, as far as, uh, and we're continuing to, to track and watch in the upstream, there's within the SIG apps um, around Kubernetes, where there's, you know, it's, uh, that primary focus around that is around uh, enabling a number of, of, of application tooling, if you will, around Kubernetes. Not that it's any given uh, uh, supported set of tools are endorsing one, but clearly Helm is one that is, uh, is used widely by the community, and they're going through a process of defining what Helm three is. And so we're, you know, Red Hat continues to work in that community, continue to work with, uh, you know, that to to drive to find a way forward to provide a supported fashion 
a supported solution as needed uh, to meet the customer use cases. So yeah, any feedback there, and we're continuing to look at it and evaluate it. And we're, and we're continuing to also to evolve what how we build OpenShift and how we add uh, the different capabilities into Kubernetes. And so and as you look at the service catalog, it's actually built in as, a, as an add-on itself. And so uh, then, um, uh, so then you can, you know, sort of build uh, the various components of OpenShift as as sort of add-ons, if you will, to to base uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, so, yeah, there you go. There's another follow-on question for that. So it's a two it's a two part question, I guess. Is if so if you took Helm question out of that and just said to use something to install OpenShift components, um, more of like I want to have a Kubernetes, I want to in, inject uh, OpenShift components. Yeah, so there's a that's a model we're heading down. As you as you well know, we we started with this journey around building OpenShift based on Kubernetes and contributing to Kubernetes well over three and a half years ago. And so when we built some of the core concepts, it was done in such a way without an, a true and extension model kind of built in or an add-in model. Uh, we've worked with the community to help build those things in and start to build new capabilities that way. But at the same time, uh, there's a cost involved and time, right, to, to move things to be more of this, this add-on or plug-in model. So we're continuing to evaluate those things and, and do what makes sense based on our, our customer needs there. And how those add-ons exactly get installed, whether technology is Helm or something else, I think that's still to be determined. But since currently Red Hat doesn't have a Helm-supported solution, I you know, would have to see. I think we're at a close here, Steve. Thank you very okay. much. Um, I know I, I'm trying to get you to do this in 30 minutes or less. It's impossible. So um, and thanks for answering all the questions. And Tushar for joining us and Ben as well. Um, we will do this again um, soon. And um, again, hopefully you'll all join us in Austin um, where we have lots of engineers in the room to answer even more questions around 3.7. And um, look for the blog post shortly. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.